Uh, my name is John Lamesny. I'm a technology consultant and graphic designer, and I worked mostly in academia in my career, but um, recently decided to become a full-time consultant. I've been doing consulting for probably 20 years, and when I left my last nine-to-five job to do consulting full-time, it was very scary, but um, things worked out because... I had knowledge on my side, and I had a lot of great contacts, and we're going to talk more about that. Okay. Um, first question, McKenzie. For an information technology or cybersecurity related career, what paths, opportunities, and or strengths should the student identify or focus on? I love that question. So my answer was mathematics, observational skills, and Linux. Also, trying to understand every detail of knowledge contained in something. It really doesn't matter what it is. It could be flowers, it could be food, it could be language, uh, but you should be really dedicated and enthusiastic about something. The benefit of that is that if you're enthusiastic and learn everything that you can about one particular thing, you sort of understand something about everything. <coughs> so, no matter what it is that you're passionate about, Focusing on that until you understand it through and through is kind of important, even if it's not technology-based, because when you apply that same way of thinking to technology, it will still apply. What is the job outlook in the information technology cybersecurity field? Well, it's increasing exponentially. And uh, part of the reason that it's increasing exponentially is because we all have technology sort of floating through our lives all the time. And it is increasingly easy to thwart security in technologies. Technologies are flawed <laughs> in the same way that everything in a way is flawed. And uh, the problem is that when you have a system that has a lot of money in it or has a lot of information in it, it becomes a target. And in fact, we're starting to see warfare uh, taking place in information security. And we're starting to see uh, banks and uh, major retail chains like Target and uh, entertainment companies like Sony being attacked in an electronic fashion. So uh, to think about what jobs in technology have the most potential in the next five to ten years, I would say uh, certainly information technology in general, but cybersecurity specifically, because there's a lot of companies who are very scared right now about the fact that they're probably not prepared for the next wave of attacks. How did you become interested in this field? So, um, I first really caught the bug of being an instructional technologist or a technologist in general uh, in a class in college where we had a computer lab and I was really excited because I had my home computer, my PC at home, uh, and I really like discovered it. I really studied it. I knew how it worked. And so I would go into computer labs in school, and I would want to express what I knew. I wanted to help people, and I wanted to help people with technology specifically because it seemed like it was an especially helpful way to be. And that's essentially what my career has been ever since. So I got excited about helping people, and I got excited and passionate about technology. And bringing those two things together led me to the career path that I have now. Thank you. Thank you. Did you know you were going to do this job when you were a teenager? I definitely did not. And um, the, the only inkling that I had when I was a teenager, or, or actually more accurately like 12, was that I had a computer. And my mom like forced me to get a computer. And uh, they were on sale or something. And she was really... Uh, excited because she had heard about how technology was going to become more important in the next 20 years, which of course we know now it did. And so she got me a TI 994A, which was a self contained computer that you wrote BASIC on. And BASIC was a language like JavaScript or PHP, but it was an early, early language. And it was relatively easy to learn and only probably had 200 commands. And so I got excited about that. I made my own ATM machine where you like, you know, had to put in the code in order to get into your money information. And then <laughs> you, uh, in order to take out money, you had to, you had to write out all that code in order to make that back and forth happen and have it be interactive. 
which is very common today. If you learn anything about programming, that's all it is, is essentially making an application. So uh, that was when I knew I was excited about technology, but I didn't think, I thought of it as a dream to be able to do it for a living. So um, in, a, in a way, my dream's been realized. Your educational background. So my educational background has little, if anything, to do with technology. Uh, I have a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Sculpture, and I have a Master's Degree in Organizational Leadership. The reason that I focus on technology and the work that I do is because what I'm passionate about, what I'm deeply, deeply attracted to is helping people with technology. And I love technology. I mean, I get excited about new technologies. I like to read news about technology. I listen to radio shows about technology. And I do it for fun. So the fact that I get paid in order to do what I think is incredibly fun is kind of exciting. Um, but my background, even though it's not directly related to technology, fine arts gave me an understanding of creativity, creative problem solving, and uh, organizational leadership, of course, helped me to understand how organizations work. And so I use those things in my work and life every day. And I highly recommend that path to anybody who <laughs> is interested in being a technologist. As it turns out, it was a really good pair of majors for me to take. But I wouldn't have known that when I was in college <laughs> or even in my master's that they would come in so handy. Thank you for your question. What types of courses do you recommend for high school students? Well, you, you have probably heard this series of ideas before. I think that you should focus on science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. Um, you may have heard this expressed as uh, STEM, right? You probably even have STEM programs where you're going to school. Yeah. And STEM, or S-T-E-A-M, is an extension of that to include the arts. And I think that all those things come together to make a perfect um, storm for somebody who wants to get into technology. Um, science is definitely involved because you have to use the scientific method or in order to solve technology problems. Uh, engineering is definitely involved. Engineering, uh, the web, for example, is important in technology. And the arts and creativity are especially important because you usually have to make something attractive in order for it to be successful. So STEAM is really a good set of um, things to learn if you're interested in technology because it touches on a whole bunch of different aspects of technology that you might not necessarily see the connections of. Thank you. Thank you. Did you find any clubs or extracurricular activities especially helpful? Well, I personally did not, at least not when I was your age. And um, there were programs available. There were after-class uh, groups that got together to talk about computers and to uh, hack. And I didn't participate in them because I didn't know how important it was to me. And as I got older, I definitely added those groups um, and, and gave back to those groups whenever possible. One of the first things I did um, when I was really interested in technology as a career was I became a chair on the board for a Linux users group in Princeton. And the reason that was important was because we got together and talked about things in a broad way and did a lot of problem solving and I started to understand the kinds of needs that people had. So getting together with people of a like mind in regards to technology is always a good idea. And there's probably maker spaces in your area and people who are doing making. Make is a movement where we're trying to rediscover how not to buy or to just simply use what somebody else makes for us, but rather make our own. And that extends to cooking, it extends to you know, making greeting cards, it extends to 3D printing, it extends to electronics. And it's an exciting time. I, I sort of wish that I was your age, not for the obvious reasons, but uh, because there's so many exciting things going on right now that are geared towards you. And um, definitely look in your area for makerspaces. That's probably the best advice I can give anybody who is interested in technology. 
is an advanced degree in spiritual to a, to a career success in this field? Thank you for your question. It, it is definitely not. And uh, the reason I say that is because, for example, my degrees, I have an advanced degree, but it has nothing to do with technology. And uh, the reason that I am uh, good at what I do is because I really know it. And the reason I really know it is because I love it. I mean, I, I get really excited about technology every day. So if you study and if you practice and if you participate in various groups uh, regarding technology, you can be the best technologist there is. It really doesn't have to do with having that degree that's related to technology. I will say this, that most of the people who I know who are really deeply interested in technology tend to have higher education degrees. I don't know if that's a coincidence. I certainly don't think it's correlative, but um, I think that there are a lot of people who love technology and do what I do who also love learning and love lifelong learning. And so while it's not required to have a degree, it's very common in this industry to have uh, advanced degrees. Thank you for your question. What skills are the most important to acquire in this field? So the thing that I would emphasize is if you're going to be a technologist, if you're going to be a security expert especially, you should begin to learn how to code. And in, in case that's not obvious, right? So you should be learning HTML and CSS and JavaScript and PHP because those are the tools of the trade. The more uh, you understand about how programming works, the better off you will be as a technologist because you'll be able to understand what's going on under the surface. It's one thing to be able to look at a computer and use what's been presented to you as that application. It's another thing entirely to be able to understand why the application is doing what it's doing and how it could be improved. My advice for uh, you beyond that in regards to coding is to emphasis is to emphasize your learning with standards based and open source technologies and open source technologies are applications that are distributed or services that are distributed by learning about JavaScript and PHP and these other things and focusing on open source technologies you have the opportunity to look inside of an application and understand how it works. An example of an application that you probably already use that is open source is Chrome or Firefox. Anybody use Chrome or Firefox? Yeah, so when you use those applications, you're using open source software. You all know about open source software? I don't know. Tell us more, maybe. Okay, so open source means that you can use the application just like any other application, like you could use uh, Microsoft Windows. But the thing is that the source code is also available, meaning the way that it was built, the, the actual code that was used to compile that application. And as a result, you can go into that code and see every line of it. You can see where the password is captured, you can see where a particular function is created, and you can add on to those functions in open source software, whereas with proprietary software, uh, you don't have the ability to make those changes. In fact, you can get into a lot of trouble by trying to make changes to proprietary software. So code, code, code. Those are the skills that you really need in order to be a truly great technologist. What professional organizations should students join to be successful in this field? I found this question to be very similar to the other question about uh, organizations, and I would emphasize again, go and find makerspaces. Go and find uh, groups of people who are coming together to understand how things work in general. And in those groups will be people who are focusing on technology specifically. <laughs> you will learn at an astronomical rate when you are interacting in those groups. Whereas if you're just learning on your own, it might be more comfortable, but it definitely won't be as effective. So makerspaces, go find a makerspace, probably at a library somewhere near you. Your consulting practice covers a wide range of services. <coughs> what is your primary focus and what are your major job responsibilities? So uh, there are a lot of things that I do in my business. Uh, 
and that covers graphic design, web development, system administration, all kinds of things. But the focus really is web development. That's where the bulk of my money comes from. And what that means for me is knowing system administration through and through, knowing the machines and servers that I'm running, knowing the services that I'm running like WordPress or Drupal, making sure that I understand graphic design too because in order to develop uh, somebody's website, you not only have to put up the site and put the text in it, but you also need to understand why it looks the way that it looks and what makes it look better. So there's a whole bunch of little tasks that I have to do with different clients and it all comes together to be called web development. Do you work with other people on a team or by yourself? Thank you for your question. Um, I do all of those. So I have my business and I'm helping people on an individual one-on-one -on -one basis. I, I might work with somebody in California and I'm in New Jersey. And so that definitely is a situation where I'm still working with somebody else remotely, but I'm doing most of the work myself by myself. And I prefer that really. Um, there are plenty of other situations though with local businesses or local efforts where I work directly in a team. Like for example, um, you all are familiar with TED Talks? Yeah. Right? And you know TEDx? So TEDx is you're able to get a license from the TED organization so that you can run a sort of mini TED in your own town. And so I've been a part of like three or four of these and it always involves a team effort because you need somebody who's responsible for marketing, somebody who's responsible for technology, that's usually me, somebody who's responsible for helping to find speakers and so on. And so each of those people have to interact with me so that I can update the website or so that I can work on graphics. And I have to interact with each of them to make sure that the content that I'm putting up is accurate and, and in other situations, I might be working with all technologists. Like uh, I recently worked with a school district to move them from Microsoft Exchange services to Google uh, Apps for Education. And in that case, I was working on a team, but I was one of about six technologists. And so there's a lot of opportunities for me to do individualized work, but there's a lot of opportunities too, and it's very important to be able to work with uh, people from uh, different walks of life and different capabilities so that we can all come together and accomplish this. What is your typical work day like? So I'm, I'm going to answer this in sort of a cliche way. There, there's no such thing as a typical day. I, now, I've worked in academia and industry uh, where I went in at the same time as everybody else. We, we went in at 9, we stayed until 5, we had lunch at 12, and it was very, very structured, right? So we had to be somewhere, you know, first thing in the morning, we had to be somewhere uh, at 10 o'clock, we had to be somewhere at 1 o'clock, and so on. And it was according to what was going on in the entire organization that I had to be concerned with what the organization wanted rather than establishing my own schedule. By establishing my own schedule in my independent consulting, it's a lot different. Every day is, is an opportunity where I might have a meeting at, at 10 o'clock one day and 2 o'clock in the afternoon another day. I might be working on somebody's website at 2 in the afternoon the next week, and then three o'clock in the morning the next week, it's, it really varies. In general, I try to keep my activity for my business between 9 a.m. and 9 p.m., but even that is kind of difficult. And there's another question in here where we'll talk about how many days a week I work, but it's, it's pretty much constant. And I don't mean that to sound scary or bad. It's because I love what I do, work isn't work anymore work is work is like play and I happen to get paid to do what I love so 12-hour days are not as big of a deal as you might think thank you thank you what are the greatest challenges and rewards of your position so the, the greatest challenge that I have is money and, um, that might sound obvious but it's, it's certainly true for me. 
if I continued to work in academia or in any nine to five job, you get a check every week or two weeks or a month. And you don't have to worry so much about where your next check is going to come from. My biggest challenge in this business is making sure that there is an abundance of checks coming in because it's different to have 15 people in a month pay your salary as opposed to one person paying your salary every month. And the, the way that you get jobs is not magic. You have to have a reputation. You have to do good on the previous jobs so that you get continuing jobs. You have to have that good reputation because your clients will talk to their friends and their uh, colleagues and hopefully refer them back to you. So the challenge is money, but luckily it is a reasonable challenge. You just have to keep a certain frequency of incoming work. And every once in a while you get a windfall where it's like a $10,000 job or something and you can rest a bit. <laughs> but most of the time it's, you're running. You're always, you know, making sure that you have, you know, two meetings on Monday, two meetings on Wednesday, two meetings on Friday, and then opportunities to work in between. So, uh, that's the biggest challenge. The biggest reward by far is flexibility. The ability to go for a walk on a beautiful day like today. And I probably will do that as soon as we're done with our call. Not because I'm slacking off, but because it's time to take a walk. And when I was working in a nine to five job, I couldn't just leave in the middle of the day and go enjoy the day. That would be uh, tantamount to being absent without leave, but I'm my own boss. And so while there's a lot of responsibility with that, there's a lot of flexibility with it too. I have the opportunity to stop and just think about what's going on and not have to worry about somebody looking over my shoulder and saying, you know, where's that task? Where's that task? That was one of the things that I didn't realize how much of a stress effect that had on me in my everyday life when I was working nine to five. And so for me, any responsibility, responsibilities or challenges like money are easily outweighed by the benefit of flexibility. Thank you for your question. I love that question. What is your schedule like and how many days do you work a week? So I, I do work seven days a week. I've only recently decided that I'm going to start taking time on the weekends to just have like not do work. And there are certain times when work is not going on. Like uh, I have two kids and whenever I'm with my kids in a dedicated way, I'm just with my kids. Nobody calls. I don't, I don't do anything when I'm with my kids. Uh, but aside from that, basically my phone is available. I advertise my phone number everywhere. And um, sometimes I get calls in, at two in the morning because I'm working with a client somewhere else in the world. And that's perfectly fine. Um, so my schedule is, is unpredictable. But I'm very, very good about making sure that my calendar is up to date all the time. And in fact, I have a really cool tool where I send a link to people when they say, when are you available? They go to the link, they can look at my calendar and see exactly what's going on. Or they can, more importantly, they can see what's blocked out and they can just grab a spot. Um, and the beauty of that is that I never have overlap. I'm, it's really easy for me to schedule new meetings with people and it's, it's fairly automated. So I might wake up on a Monday and find out that over the weekend, you know, three people made new meeting requests and uh, I'm like stacked for the next two days. So there's not a lot of predictability to my schedule. I can't tell you exactly what I'll be doing next week, for example. Um, but generally speaking, everything I do gets recorded and everything I do or every meeting I set up or any action I take usually ends up in my calendar so that I can look back, you know, two weeks, from, uh, two weeks back from today or a month back from today or six months back from today and see exactly what was going on. That's so important in my work. Um, but one of the funny things is when you do that, when you look through the calendar and you look at how weeks change week to week, there are no two weeks that are the same. 
every every week is wildly different and that's beautiful you know it's really nice to have that flexibility to say that i'm not going to have two similar weeks it's one of the things i really love about this job how many hours do you work in a typical day and do you travel in your job i'm having a little bit of trouble hearing you uh, are you asking me about travel yeah and how many hours do you work she combined questions because you kind of addressed a little bit about the number of hours you work a week. So she's also asking how many, uh, how, do you travel much in your job? So I thought that was asked in the last question, but I, I was mistaken. So I, I work um, in a typical week. It might be 60, it might be 80 hours, but it's not all labor. Like a lot of it is thought and planning and driving and meeting and not all of it's paying. So uh, there's a lot of preparation for uh, certain projects or meetings where I might be spending time on something and not really being paid for it, but just making an investment. Or like I might volunteer to go and help somebody uh, because I think it might lead to goodwill. And so the hours add up. And it, like I said, might be 60 hours, might be 80 hours. Um, it is seldom like 40 hours. And, uh, yes, I travel a great deal in my work. I, I travel a lot locally, uh, meaning that I'll go to I'm – I'm right outside of Princeton, New Jersey. And I'll go to Trenton or I'll go to New Brunswick or I'll go to New York or I'll go to Philadelphia or go to different parts of New Jersey every week. More interestingly, I traveled a lot all over the country in the beginning of this year until now. I went to – Los Angeles, I went to San Francisco, I went to Washington, D.C., I went to Chicago, I went to um, lots of different places, and it was all paid for me, like, it, because I had to be there, travel was part of that, of that price on their part, and it's beautiful, it's like you, you get to go and do what you have to do for a certain time during those days. And then the rest of the time is yours to just, to just enjoy that city. So I hadn't predicted that, but I'm really glad that it's turned out that way because I don't, I don't have a lot of travel lust, but I really enjoy visiting new cities and learning about new places. Can you work from, from home some or part of the time, and are there any health hazards in this profession? So I work from home most of the time. <laughs> And um, when I work in other places, it's usually a client's uh, residence or a client's business. And the only in-between is like co-working spaces. Co-working spaces are where people come together in order to do work, but they're all doing different work. And it's, it's a good way to come together and maybe brainstorm with people who are like-minded, but not necessarily doing work with you. So there's a wide range, uh, but... If I want to work from home, I do. And if I want to work from, you know, out in the middle of the woods where there's Wi-Fi, then I can. It's, it's a beautiful thing to not have to be locked into a cubicle and rather, you know, make a choice about where it is that you want to work. That was one of the things, actually. I, I worked at Princeton University for a few years, and um, it has a beautiful, beautiful campus. And every day I wanted to go explore the campus. And that was one of the things I was really excited about, about that job. And I did it so much that my boss said, I think you need to be at your desk more. And it was really kind of sad because that's one of the things I loved about that job was the ability to go out and look at sculptures and buildings and architecture and fields and all kinds of things that Princeton had to offer. And because Wi-Fi was everywhere, it wasn't as though I wasn't doing my work. It wasn't as though I wasn't connected to the work I was doing. It just was there needed to be a, an appearance that I was present in my desk. And I'd never have to worry about that again. Like I, I can work basically from wherever I want with my phone in many cases. Are there any health hazards in this profession? So not really. Um, and I have worked in many jobs where there were health hazards. I mean, I've, I've been a groundskeeper. I've worked for Parks and Recreation. 
I used to uh, dump trash, like drive around the dump truck for the township, and I had to like, dump all the trash at the end of the weekend from all the parks. And like that was an incredibly dangerous job. And there were, you know, in my in my fine arts degree and pursuing fine arts, you encounter solvents and tools and cancer causing agents and all kinds of things every day in your work. As you're painting, you're poisoning yourself. Um, I once had a job in a factory where I had to spray paint metal, and I spray painted metal so much that I developed an allergy to it. I can't be around spray paint now. I'm so happy that I don't have those kinds of things impacting me anymore. I don't have to worry about whether or not my health is at risk. Uh, there is something to be said for this industry that you spend a lot of time sitting on your butt. And so you have to find ways to improve your fitness. You have to make sure that you're eating right. You have to make sure that you're getting up and walking around. You have to make sure that you're living a, a healthy lifestyle because this work can lead to, like many different kinds of work can, lead to um, not the best, most healthy behavior. You, you, because you spend a lot of time sitting around, that can, that can have effects on your body. But comparative to those other ill effects, I'll, I'll take it any day. How would you describe the culture of your workplace? So this is my workplace, and this is my home. And there's all my books, and there's my kitchen right there in the background, and there's my uh, sort of rack of clothes and stuff, and my cat's warm here somewhere. And if I had to describe the culture of this workplace, I would say that it is uh, casual, I'd say it's organized, I'd say it's comfortable, I'd say it's utilitarian, I'd say it's knowledge oriented, I'd say it's natural, creativity oriented, mindful, technological, healthy, sunlit, cat friendly, human friendly. Uh, we have a, there's a culture of equality here. If somebody comes in, I, I want them to feel at home and I want to feel, I want them to feel like they have a voice. And uh, I have a lot of plants in here, so it's very garden like which I think is inspiring. Um, sometimes I'll just look at a leaf on one of my plants and be inspired for a design or a color scheme or something like that. So the, the culture here is a rich one, and I'm, I'm thrilled to work here every day. What's a common myth about your job? So two come to mind. The first is the stereotype that technologists are brusque and mean, and um, uh, demeaning, you know, there's, there's like, like Saturday Night Live skits where there's a technology guy and it's like the technology guy and the technology guy is a jerk. And uh, have you ever seen the British sitcom called uh, The IT Crowd? No. Anybody ever seen The IT Crowd there? So anyway, it's a show on BBC, and, and it's not on the air anymore, but it's available on, like, Netflix and lots of other places. And it's a show about a technology team that uh, works at a, at a major company in Britain. And the running jokes are all ones that are sort of stereotypes about my industry, uh, that the tech guy picks up the phone and rolls his eyes, and the tech guy, you know always calls all his users really stupid and blah, blah, blah. That's not true. The people who I work with don't do that. The people who I work with respect the people who uh, are their clients. Uh, the other thing that I run into a lot is that people tend to call me a guru or, or think of me as having some special elevated knowledge. Meanwhile, the people who often say this to me are brilliant people. They're brilliant in their own way. They're brilliant gardeners or they're brilliant athletes or they're brilliant uh, chefs or they're brilliant um, business minds or they're brilliant in the way that they uh, develop um, woodworking or whatever it is. 
but because despite the fact that they understand that topic whatever that topic is that they know really well despite the fact that they know that better than anybody around them they don't think of themselves as a guru but some for some reason when technology comes into the picture people are like oh it's technology and I don't think that that's fair to other industries. I, I don't think that um, it's an accurate, we, we just happen to be experts in something that are, that is uh, not as well known as some other expertise areas, but that doesn't make us especially special. Um, it doesn't mean that we can uh, slack on what we know either. It, just like anybody in any industry, you have to, keep up with what's going on in that industry and so that's really important to do but when you do that people think you're magic because you know the answer to a technology problem that they wouldn't be able to figure out well in the same respect if I was talking to a gardener and I didn't know anything about gardening they would know something off the top of their head that might take me years to discover in amateur gardening so uh, that's another myth is that technology knowledge is somehow special compared to other knowledges. I really appreciate your question. Thank you. Thank you. Contrast the role of an independent consultant with employment in a large company. So I, I wrote this answer like I wrote other answers, but I really like this answer, so I'm just going to read it to you. It says, I've done both. In a large company, you're a cog. I'm not using the term negatively. You might be a very important cog that keeps the mill running, but at the end of the day, you're a small part of a large machine. As an independent consultant, you are the entire machine connecting to cogs of other machines. And so when I was at Ryder University or I was at Princeton University, I was a very small part of this machine. And I felt relatively small. I knew that I had value. I knew that, that I was valued within the company for the things that I took care of. But I didn't really have a lot of power. Whereas as an independent consultant, you have all the power you can stand. You know? And you're responsible when something goes wrong. And you get the praise when something goes right. And you, know, you get sued if you do something negligent as opposed to being a part of a company where you're protected uh, 10 layers deep from those things happening usually. So I would say the flexibility comes back into play when, when we're talking about independent uh, consultancy versus a being a part of a larger company or a huge company. You, you become a lot more visible because it's just you or you and just a few people. Thank you for the question. What do you enjoy most about your job? Uh, it comes back to that idea of flexibility. I, I love the fact that um, people are sort of people who work in nine to five jobs who feel like it's drudgery uh, will often be jealous of my schedule because if, if I decide that you know, two hours from now, I'm going to take a two hour coffee break. I can, it probably wouldn't be the best idea today in particular, because I have a lot going on, but I could do it and I could make it work. Uh, if I was in a big, um, company where everything was like doled out as far as where I had to be, when I wouldn't be able to do that. I would need to be where my boss wanted me to be. And it's not as though I don't have, boss a boss I just don't have a single boss uh, one of the other beautiful things that I love about this job is the ability to disconnect from the client when I want to uh, or allow them to disconnect from me when they want to uh, as opposed to being a part of let's say a university where you can't just stop working with somebody just because you don't like them you can't just stop working with somebody just because you don't have the answer you have to continue to work at that university if you're going to work there and you have to work with people who otherwise you'd just be able to walk away from. And uh, in, in light of that, I have a, a policy uh, in my business where I give the first hour away free. And I have a friend who's a business consultant and he says, why do you do that? Why do you give an hour of your time away for free with new 
consultees and I said, because I want to know whether I can work with them and I don't want to have money be in the mix. And many times at the end of the first meeting, there was no money exchanged, but I, but I was able to say, I don't think that we're going to work well together. I'll give you um, some advice on who you might be able to reach out to to help you better with your problem. Sometimes it was a personality difference and sometimes it was just that I was not cut out to do that work. But in other situations where you're, where you're forced to continue to work in that seat, uh, you don't have a choice. You just have to suck it up. And I'm glad that I don't have to. I'm glad that I can just pass on that opportunity to somebody else. Can you describe the lay of jobs in the field of work, which might also be of interest to the students? So I came up with three. Uh, one is system administrator, which is uh, not as creative of a job, but certainly requires the same kinds of knowledge. And whereas I am a general system administrator, in other words, I know how to work, work on a command line, I know how to use various protocols, a dedicated system administrator, or even a consultant who is a dedicated system administrator, needs to know a lot more about how systems interact, how to protect them, how firewalls work, and, and so forth. And so system administration is related to the kind of technology consulting I do, but is much more dedicated to uh, servers and services. Another one is emerging technologists. I see this a lot in businesses and libraries where there's an emphasis on innovation and technology, and people want to have somebody on staff who is up to date with all of the latest technologies and ideas and things on the horizon. And so uh, it's a mixture of like technology and futurism where you say a year from now, we're probably going to have drones flying through the air delivering packages, which is actually something that's happening. Or um, I've been really excited for a long time about self-driving cars from Google and I'm especially interested to know how that's going to impact um, the rest of the things that we do with vehicles and like bulldozers, you know, how long will it be after self-driving cars are in place that we won't have to have a bulldozer operator. We'll just tell a bulldozer to dig a hole over there and it'll go do it. And we're, we, we have that technology now. It's just, we, we are still getting used to the idea of automated cars. So, it's sort of like one thing at a time, and whatever happens, happens. Um, and the third job I wanted to mention is uh, application developer, which is, I, I really don't do application development, I do web development. And so uh, with application development, it's such a hot job right now. And if I was an independent app developer, I would probably make a lot more money but I would be a lot more busy. And programming is something I know how to do. As I said, you should all know how to code. Uh, but it's not something that I prefer to do, and I'm not a great programmer. And so while I know enough to help me in the work that I do, if I was a more dedicated programmer, I would probably be doing app development instead of technology consulting. Uh, certainly a related job and certainly um, has overlap but it's a specific set of skills that's different than what I do. What type of student work or internship experience would employers look for in a job applicant? So I would say that if I was looking at a resume, reviewing resumes so that I could hire somebody, I would be looking for work in libraries. I would be looking for volunteer uh, opportunities that somebody took advantage of. I would be looking for people who tutored other students. I would be looking for people who had the opportunity to study abroad. And I would be looking for uh, people who were doing web development as an intern in uh, various positions or uh, taking a position in an office in your school, for example, helping out with that department's web page. Um, if, if I was looking as a technologist hiring somebody who was new to technology but had some experience doing something. I would want them doing volunteer work. I would want them helping others. I would want them to 
show that they have an interest in making the world better. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that it's really important to get to an interview. And um, if all you have to go by as somebody who's hiring, I'm sorry, I have lawn mowers outside. If all I have to go by is a resume, I should see some things that really explode off the page and say, this is a good fit for this job. And those are the kinds of things I would look for to explode off the page, library work, tutor tutors, etc. But in the interview, the most important thing is not your experience, it's not your education, although your education is an important factor. The most important thing is that you're able to answer questions in a truthful, reasonable way. And to be able to impart to somebody the idea that you've studied and that you understand technology or that you're passionate about technology or that you will solve the problem that needs to be solved. How did you locate the right people to help you along the path to successful career? I, I thought about this question. I don't really have a great idea of how it happens um, or how it happened. But I will say this, I try to connect with people who are hubs, people who connect to other people. And one person in particular that I did this with was uh, this woman named Jamie, and she ran uh, the programming for a local library, for Princeton Public Library, and gave me opportunities to speak to people. and gave me opportunities to work on teams with people and gave me opportunities to work with the library in a professional way and that connection that single connection I had with Janie led to 10 other people who were also hubs and lots of other people who were just you know potential clients and because I started to connect with these hub people these people who connected people with other people it just sort of expanded and exploded and in a really interesting way. So I don't know if there are other factors, but that is certainly a factor, making sure that um, I connect with people who have the potential to connect with other people. Um, what type of compensation range and benefits should students expect in this industry? So when I worked in industry, uh, in academia, I made, at the end of it, about $90,000. And I was a manager of technology, and I managed people, and I was well compensated. Um, when I first started in that job, uh, about 12 years earlier, I was making about $40,000, and that was around 1998. So you can expect in an academic position uh, as a technologist, for example, to probably start around 60 and, and grow that, depending on where you are in the country. If you end up in administrative roles where you are managing entire departments or uh, a large group of people, you might make $150,000. So it really depends on what aspects of technology you are focusing on, whether you're focusing on managing technology in a, in a macro way or managing technology in a micro way. According to that size, you're going to make more or less money in the industry if you are going somewhere nine to five every day. As an independent consultant though, it's not the same because your money varies according to how many clients you have. So my first year, I think I made about $40,000. My second year, uh, so far, uh, and we're in May, right? Um, I've made about forty-five thousand dollars. So I have the rest of the year, and I'm already, I've already achieved what I made my first year. So I might have sixty thousand, I might have eighty thousand by the end of the year, but it, it it depends on the number of clients you have and how good you are at what you do. You, the sky's the limit, though. I mean, if I, if I didn't want to go and take walks or I didn't want to have a relaxing day or I didn't want to enjoy my life, I could make a million dollars on tour. But it's, 
it's not necessarily worth it for me to, to do that because all I'm really trying to do is be sustainable. I'm trying to be able to pay for my apartment, pay for my insurance, and all those things. Okay. And in this deal, is it more common to be paid by a predetermined consultant fee, sales commission, or salary? So I saw the question about sales commission, and I wonder, I wonder where that idea came from. In other words, uh, I don't know any technologists who work on commission because we don't really sell things. So I wondered if you could explain that question to me a little bit more. I need you to kind of answer the question related to your industry. So I guess the question really is more, do you have a flat fee or do you work, work more on an hourly fee? What is more common? I know you probably do both. I, I, understand, I understand what the question is asking. I'm, I'm saying we don't really have commission in, in most of the cases that I know of, we, we would not be using commission. Sure. Um, the consultant fee, is it typical? Do you more typically charge by the project or by the hour? I'm sure you do a combination. Yeah, I do a combination. And if I can, I do far less by the project pay than by the rate pay. And uh, I wish it was more by the project pay because by rate, it means that you have to all of a sudden start tracking really tightly everything that you're doing. Whereas with project pay, you just have an end date and you have things that you have to accomplish. And usually the project is more organized. Uh, so I wish there was more project pay, but it tends to be mostly rate pay. And my rate is $125 an hour. So you have to take that into account when you're talking to a client because if the client only has $200 to spend, they're going to be disappointed if you say, well, I'll give you an hour and, or, and a portion of a second hour. So usually if that happens, if I get some pushback on my rate, I will say, well, let's see what you want to accomplish and how much money you have to spend, and let's see if we can turn it into project pay. Because I would always rather do the work than not. And very often, you know, it'll turn into something where I'll do half the project for free and half the project for my normal rate. Uh, but it varies from client to client. Mostly, though, it's rate pay. Thank you. Thank you. What is the most important piece of advice you would give to someone going into this career field? So I wrote an answer for this, too. And my answer was to treat people well, to treat people with kindness and dignity and truth, to learn everything that you can and then give that knowledge away as freely as you can, and to become a source of joy for the people you work with. Did you like do any sports when you were younger? Yeah, I played basketball. I was actually pretty good at basketball. I played football and was not especially good at football because I, I don't like hurting people. <laughs> um, so the, the football coach is all like, I drove him crazy because I, I wasn't hitting very hard. Uh, yeah, I played a lot of sports and it was good experience in understanding how teams work because I need those skills now. Do you own your own company? Yes, this is my company, Lamazdi Consulting. Carson? What's your favorite sport? That's a tough one. Um, I sort of like rock climbing. And the reason I say that is, like, especially the rock climbing where, like, they don't, they don't have a lot of extraneous gear. They, like, use their fingers and, like, scale a wall because there's such determination in what they're doing and such focus. And it's an individualistic sport uh, as opposed to a group sport. And I think there's lots of benefits to group sports, but I really, I guess, like the independence of something like rock climbing. And people who are truly athletes and do rock climbing are sort of inspirational for me. How old are your kids? Oh. My, my boys are six and ten. And uh, my ten-year-old teaches me something new every time I talk to him. And my six-year-old is already kind of excited about electronics. Like we play a lot with um, electronics kits and have blinking lights and 
make circuits and stuff. And uh, I try to instill in them the same kinds of joy that I get out of life every day, whether it be cooking or walking or doing design or whatever. And I think it has taken with them because they do the same kinds of things and they are excited about life too. How much like technology-based do you think the future will be like, as, uh, as our generation becomes adults? I, so let's talk about technology as, a, as an idea, right? Books are technology. And pencils are technology. And um, using a rock to crush corn is a technology. It's just that we think about technology now as, let's say, computers and the internet and phones. But in the same way that books are not thought of as technology anymore, and even though they are, in fact, technology, it's, it's a, the application of a tool or a technique in order to accomplish some goal, um, we, we, will less, we will think less and less about computers and phones and uh, the things that we think about te as technology today. We won't think about them as technology anymore, and we will have moved on to whatever the next thing in is, whether it be brain to brain communication or whether it be space travel or whether it be, you know, whatever the next thing is. And a hundred years from now, we, we won't even recognize, you know, you think about what happened a hundred years ago in terms of technology, you know, like steam engines and, um, well, that was earlier than that, but, a hundred years from now, or a hundred years from now, we won't be able to recognize the newest technology at that time, just like the people from a hundred years ago wouldn't recognize computers. Do you think like phones and stuff will go out of, like not phones, but like I think like computers and things that we have today will go out of date? Well, they go out. They go out of date the minute that you use them. I mean, uh, this is my Android-based Nexus Five, and I love this phone. But it's it's showing its age, and it's probably less than two years old. And it, it's not an especially efficient way to compute. Although for some people, this is the only computer they have. And I think that one of the things that's interesting that's happening now is the Internet of Things. Are you all familiar with the Internet of Things? Internet of what? Internet of Things. So. The Internet of Things is a sort of technology movement that changes the way that we use technology now. And it's the idea that every object that you see around here, right, all these books and these lamps and the windows and the thermostat and my plants could all have sensors and actuators so that they could talk to the Internet. And you say, why would you need your plant to talk to the Internet, John? And I would say so that it could tell me when it was running out of water or so that it could tell me how much light that it saw today or so that it could tell me how much it grew over a week's time. And those technologies exist and they are just starting to emerge as sellable products. But if you get involved in labor spaces, as I suggested earlier, you, you could go ahead and make a a plant that tweeted at you whenever it was too dry. I mean, that's very easy to do, and it's stuff that people are doing today. So we're in an incredibly exciting time, and I think that laptops and phones could very well be um, given up for some new technology that we can't predict. Maybe it's a flexible piece of plastic that does everything that our phone and laptop does now. That, that's probably the way I think that these things are going to go because phones are about as thin as they can get without snapping or bending. And now we have bendable surfaces. They're just starting to show up. And so we're probably going to roll up almost like a newspaper our computers and stick them in our back pocket. And all those people that say they really love the feel of the newspaper compared to their laptop will be able to have that feeling again with their computer. Thank you so much again for your time investment with us today. It is greatly appreciated. It's my pleasure, and thank you so much for the opportunity. It was a pleasure to meet you all. I hope you have a great rest of your day. You too. Bye, John. Bye.